and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 3.30. Stay tuned next for A Rude Awakening. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, documentary filmmaker Antonia Glenn's latest feature, The Ito Sisters, will be screened on November 5th at the East Bay Media Center. I'll be speaking to her and... I'll be rebroadcasting my interview with freelance technology writer Julianne Tweeten from last week regarding her latest article in In These Times on how Facebook, Google, and Twitter are cutting off the flow of information on the left. Stay tuned. The Ito Sisters is a film that captures the rarely told stories of the earliest Japanese immigrants to the United States and their American-born children. In particular, the film focuses on the experience of Issei, or immigrant, and Nisei, or first generation born in the United States. Um, it's about women. Ito Sisters is about the women whose voices have largely been excluded from American history. And on the line to talk about this once again is Miss Antonia Glenn. Antonia Grace Glenn. I love your middle name. <laughs> 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 yes, we've had her on the uh, uh, talked to her before in regards to this amazing flick. And uh, it's going to be screening once again. And uh, I, I can't believe it. This is wonderful. It's an amazing website. And uh, folks are going to have the chance to see the Ito Sisters once again. Antonia, thank you so much for being on Rude Awakening. Sabrina, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Now, this is an amazing story, and this is a very personal story for you. Um, talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, so the again, I, it's one of the things that I argue in the film is that the um, evacuation and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II was really the culmination of essentially a 60-year anti-Japanese campaign. And so with the... Um, with President Roosevelt signing Executive Order 9066 after Pearl Harbor that provided an opportunity for the evacuation of Japanese from the West Coast, which then freed up um, largely agricultural lands that were being controlled by Japanese Americans and that were very, very productive and lucrative. Those, those lands were then freed up for, you know, for white landowners who were did not want to compete with what they considered to be an unfair ethnic um, workforce and economy. And so my family was was part of the more than 120,000 Japanese Americans who were evacuated with, in the case of my family, one month's notice to basically, you know, get rid of all of their possessions and to move to relocation centers and then to the camps with only what they could carry on their on their persons. And so, you know, this included my mother when she was a year and a half old. Um, my, you know, my great auntie, Nancy had also had two small children and then had two more children in the camps. Um, and so they suffered tremendous hardship and, and in some cases, tragedy as a result of the incarceration. Um, and they share these stories and they're, you know, they're, uh, some of these were stories that we had never heard before, and they, you know, they share it in sort of a very kind of matter of fact, often sometimes cheerful way, that belies the, you know, the real sort of hardship and and heartbreak that is often underlying what they actually, you know, the actual experiences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Ito sisters, Natsui, Huruye, and Hideko. I mean, just amazing, amazing that you were able to capture that history. Now, the big, big important stuff. Where is the Ito Sisters going to be screened? Well, we are going to be screened uh, this upcoming Sunday, November 5th at 4 p.m. Uh, as part of the Berkeley Video and Film Festival. And this will be at the East Bay Media Center um, at 1939 Addison Street in Berkeley. And for more information, people can go to our website, which is itosisters.com. And they can also go to the website for the Berkeley Video and Film Festival, where you can purchase tickets. 
All right. And hey, if you want to feature a screening, you can also get in contact with Miss Antonia Glenn at the easel, etosisters.com, etosisters.com. Now, once again, give us that information. November 5th, 1939, Addison Street in Berkeley. Go ahead. Yes, that's right. Uh, so it's going to be uh, Sunday, November 5th at 4 p.m. at the East Bay Media Center. And the address is 1939 Addison Street in Berkeley. All right. Wonderful. Miss Antonia Grace Glenn, thank you so much for keeping us abreast of uh, the screenings of the Ito Sisters. It's an amazing piece, amazing historical piece, a very personal piece. And those are always the best to, to get us to connect empathetically with what's what has happened and uh, what is happening right now with this uh, crazy man in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Antonia Glenn, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. Sabrina, thank you so much. I deeply appreciate it. Here's the rebroadcast of my interview with independent technology journalist Julianne Tweeten describing the online censoring of the left via Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Now, what you do is you write about the intersectionality of the technology industry and uh, socioeconomic issues. How are you pulling this together? Are we, are we, are you saying that um, folks of lower socioeconomic status are quicker to believe? Uh, what the fake news is putting out or, or talk to us about it. Oh, uh, definitely not. Um, mm-hmm. I So I, I tend to write about the intersections of the tech industry and socioeconomics and culture. Um, and I think this is certainly something that is that is um, part of the zeitgeist right now is the concern about fake news and about Russiagate, which is um, uh, another concept I explore in the piece. But um the idea is that the the tech industry, I think, is is kind of one of the latest targets um, in, or I should say, it's been a target for a while, but it's it's kind of resurging as a target now in the whole fake news narrative um, because. Uh, Facebook, Google, and Twitter are, they're going to be facing Congress next month about, uh, ads or accounts that they have hosted, um, that are supposedly linked to Russia. Um, so this kind of, uh, resurgence began to surface when Facebook was accused of, of, um, or I guess it passed over about 3,000 ads, $100,000 worth of ads that are, again, supposedly linked to Russia and that were thought to sow discord among the American public um, and sway the election. Mm-hmm. Um, this has been an issue that's been raised with, uh, with Twitter as well and with Google. Um, so that was the issue that I was exploring in this piece, and uh, I, I just wanted to kind of parse it and and look at it critically and, and see, uh, kind of examine the fact that it doesn't really hold water. Mm-hmm. Now, what exactly does not hold water? What exactly does not hold water? Uh, yeah. That you're exploring in your piece. Um, I think the, the um, suggestion that Facebook, Google, and Twitter – through the election or that they I think that they played this really, really huge role because of connections to Russia. That's again, that's the narrative that is being um, conveyed by, I think, a lot of a lot of kind of centrist corporate Democrats Mm -hmm. um, in government. And uh, what I wanted to explore was uh, the kind of nebulous nature Mm -hmm. of the relationship between these tech companies and whatever relationship they supposedly have to Russia, um, because as I, I noted um, some quotes from a Nation article in the piece by Aaron Mate, who who said um, the number of accounts uh, under suspicion on Twitter that were thought to be linked to Russia was 200, and it's it's uh, it's a platform with 328 million users. Um, Whoa. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so, as again, I'll quote him. He says, to suggest 200 accounts out of 328 million could have had an impact is as much an insult to common sense as it is to basic math. Mm-hmm. Um, he also mentioned uh, the 
scope of the Facebook ad buys. So it's $100,000 compared to a $6.8 billion election. And Facebook is also, it's a multi-billion dollar company. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think 90% of its revenue comes from ads. So that is, that is a scintilla of its ad revenue right there. So it's, I think, um, one small part of kind of um, debunking this myth is to look at um, how much the effect of these ads and these accounts is inflated and exaggerated. Mm, my goodness. This is just, um, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in. Um, let me see here. Hold on a second. Now, fake, fake news, fake news. Let's go back to that. Yeah. That phrase. Um, and how, like in the, the, just in the title alone, I mean, it says says a lot, you know, <laughs> fake news being the right and margin, which is marginalizing the left. Um, how are you viewing the marginalization of the left because of the fake news? Because we're I mean, are we seeing that that folks on the left or from your research doing this particular article? Did you? find evidence that the left is being marginalized even more because of the fake news because they're believing it um or is it because of the new restrictions that facebook and google have placed on and twitter have placed on their their uh their company and and on their accounts um how how is that merging and not merging yeah um so one i think one way to start with answering this question is to look at uh, google so google in response to um kind of accusations that it had been complicit in disseminating fake news, uh, adjusted its algorithms um, starting in 2016. And then in April of this year, um, various left-leaning news sites tended to, or were, were noticing um, significant drops in their search traffic. And, you know, most most search traffic that most websites have uh, comes from Google because it has basically a search monopoly. Um so, like, the World Socialist website reported that it had a 67% drop in uh, traffic uh, between April and July of this year. Um, and it released a, a report saying that other sites like Alternate and Democracy Now! and Common Dreams, which are all left-leaning sites, um, reported significant drops in their search traffic, um, ranging from, like, the 49 to 70-some percent. Um and uh, alternate, I think, uh, apparently lost an average of 1.2 million of its 2.7 million unique visitors. Right, um, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so those are so those are some more kind of concrete examples of actual left media um, losing traffic that would otherwise be beholden to Google. Mm. Um, so, that, <laughs> so we're talking about Mother Jones. We're talking about Truth Day. Uh, you got a quote in here from uh, Chris Hedges, who's who's one of my faves. Um, oh, great. Yeah, he's great. He's really great. <laughs> uh, Internet users do, doing searches on Google since alg- algorithms were put in place are diverted from sites such as Truth Day and directed to mainstream publications such as the New York Times. Now, that is terrifying. Yes, it is. I mean, I mean, what? I talk to me. I don't know. I'm speechless right now. Yeah. I mean, this is like very, very shocking to know. I mean, that that's the same for outlets like uh, KPFA and our four uh, sister stations uh, mm-hmm. here in the Pacifica Network. I mean, we're online just like everybody else. I mean, wh- ha- what are we supposed to do about about that? You know what I mean? I mean, as yeah. as folks that are, are, are contributors to uh, left wing or left leaning uh, media outlets like you and myself what are what are we supposed to do to try to make that up i mean they these are algorithms that are keeping people from getting to the information um most likely the truth uh, as far as what the (laughs) left is putting out there hold that thought we're going to take a little musical break and we'll be back in about 30 seconds or less stay tuned and we're back we are back speaking to the lovely julianne (laughs) tweeton and i tell you your last name's not spelled like you're saying it (laughs) like it's supposed to be pronounced (laughs) very original loving it julianne (laughs) tweeton is the author of how the fake news scare is marginal 
analyzing the left. It's her latest article. It came out on October 11th uh, in These Times, from the In These Times uh, online publication. And uh, Julianne, now we were just uh, talking about how how marginalizing um, these algorithms are. Um, wh- wh- how how is the left supposed to combat that? And and uh, it's going to be twofold, probably a threefold question because I'm like that. Um, how is that? Gonna, <laughs> how can the left combat it? And is it something that's going to need to be done um, uh, in a court of law? Uh, because this is a huge federal case now, especially with the whole Russia, Russia, invest- Russia Gate, we'll just call it that. And is there something that, uh, that that we can do in the interim? And another question: How long are they going to keep these algorithms in place? Go ahead. Uh, those are great questions. Um, it's it's difficult to say, but I mean, legal action could very well be a part of this. Um, because ev- the evidence is kind of mounting. It's but censorship. Think, yeah, it's, it's I know. censorship. And a lot of, I think a lot of the, the tech companies, I, uh, I noted this in the article, but at least, uh, Google is, um, claiming that computers should be able to preemptively detect fake news and artificial intelligence should be able to preemptively detect fake news. But the issue there is, is who are, who's designing this artificial intelligence and these algorithms and because um obviously the the values and the politics of whoever's designing these algorithms and engineering them will uh transfer into um how that fake news is detected so um that's <laughs> one thing to keep in mind yeah. um but i think so much of this i think is just these are just symptoms of the privatization of the internet and mm-hmm. of the um, the monopolies that companies like Facebook, Google, and Twitter hold. Uh, Facebook, you know, kind of holds a, a social media monopoly um, and somewhat of a, a news dissemination monopoly. Google holds a search monopoly. And um, I know there are a lot of discussions about, or maybe not enough discussions about kind of nationalizing mm-hmm. um, these uh, services. Mm-hmm. Um I think I I read a quote somewhere. I'm hoping I can remember it properly. It was um, monopolies are the market's way of determining something a public good. Hmm. Um, and <laughs> I know that this is not maybe not something everyone will agree with, but I think um, again, it's it's these are just these are symptoms of again private companies uh, with very insular. Uh, executive groups mm. largely rich white men right, um right. who are controlling you know whether directly or indirectly the information that their consumers are exposed to mm-hmm. um and so it's not unfortunately i don't think there are any quick fixes but i i, I do think of this in terms of um kind of private seizing of i think what should be public goods um yeah access to information online, which I think is, is something that everyone uh, should be entitled to and that everyone should should um, mm-hmm. not have a problem mm-hmm. uh, acquiring really? uh, the yeah. free flow of information online. Yeah. And, and so I think just that that the um, the prevalence of corporations in controlling the flow of information online is is a huge issue and is something that um, I think some parts of the left are are grappling with and and trying to organize around right now but it's it's something that we all have to keep in mind and um uh for lack of a better word so when this when the algorithms were algorithms were implemented that was in april but we didn't find out about it until what july august or so this year and they haven't put it's not a uh, there's no time limit on how long they're going to keep these algorithms in place thus throwing the left into this uh, frenzied act of resistance online yes. as well as in person. So it seems to me that that's going to throw people into places like Tor to to get their information. I uh-huh. mean, if they can't, if they're already privy to uh, outlets like Mother Jones and these times, uh, um, um, Alternet, etc., then they're just. Can't, I mean, there's there's always a way. We always find a way, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. The only problem is, you know, Tor is. Tor, like I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned Tor um, and just 
uh, very high security um, alternatives to using the internet. Um, mm-hmm. But I know one problem with those is that they're not accessible to everybody. Um, digital literacy can be a very difficult thing to develop, you know, um, mm-hmm. and because it requires a lot of resources that not everybody has. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but you're you're absolutely right in um, mentioning that you know, there are alternatives. It's just, yeah, there's some kind of hurdles to get past in order to really understand how to use those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Um, And another part of your article, which is, which is very scary and revealing. Um, You say here, Facebook has routinely removed posts. Let's see here. What's more Facebook and Twitter, both have patterns of muzzling activists um, and people of color while protecting white men. As ProPublica has revealed, Facebook has routinely removed posts of those who review white supremacy and police killings of people of color, even when they don't violate its policies while classifying white men and protected characters white men as a protected category entitled to more protections from free speech than such subsets as black children that is just man it's just terrifying it is terrifying and this is an automatic thing all an automatic thing placed or put in place by an algorithm created by probably some white guy all right. Uh huh. I think <laughs> quite a few white guys. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's and, and this is this is also um, kind of a lesson in in again understanding that none of the technological platforms we use are objective. Um, it might seem like they're all kind of distantly designed by. Um, algorithms or they're all kind of distantly operated by algorithms but again it's it's humans with their own sets of politics and their own right experiences and their own kind of insular backgrounds often um, mm-hmm. who are designing these and this is something that has surfaced particularly on facebook and twitter um propublica has done a series of of really great reports on uh facebook um uh, giving prefer consistently giving preferential treatment, particularly to white men, mm. um, while uh, banning various uh, black activists, particularly black women. Uh, Didi Delgado, who is a Black Lives Matter activist, has been banned, I think, multiple times, and she was eventually inspired to write an essay called Mark Zuckerberg Hates Black People. Mm. Um, yeah, <laughs> which I, I recommend. Um, All right. Check and- it out, y'all. Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> Hates Black women all right okay um there was also uh i believe leslie mack um was also banned i believe on facebook for speaking out against white supremacy Mm. um meanwhile clay higgins who is he's a white uh, i believe congressman in louisiana i hope i'm getting that right Mm -hmm. clay Mm -hmm. higgins uh posted a status update about killing Muslims. And as far as I know, I think largely because of his prestige as a politician, uh, there was no penalty for that, Mm -hmm. for an incredibly violent racist statement. Wow. Um, Yeah, he's with the U.S. US, uh, House of Representatives. He's a congressman out of Louisiana, 3rd District, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Twitter has had very similar problems. there have been a couple of oh I, I recently read an essay by Jesse Daniels on Dave Magazine about the white supremacy inherent in Twitter that I recommend as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know Twitter has verified Richard Spencer, who is oh the that face guy of oh. the neo Nazi movement, and um, is I know uh, has been very slow to respond to particularly women of color who tend to face the most harassment on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been, and you know, Twitter was uh, kind of at the front and center of the proliferation of the Pepe meme, um, oh. the white supremacist meme. So there's, there are these patterns that we see. Um, and Google had the James Demore manifesto that circulated internally and then externally. Um, mm-hmm. If you remember that, um, he was kind of rail. He was a former Google employee. He was railing against. Oh yes, diversity yes. initiatives. Yeah, and yes, yes, that up. was from this past summer. Yes, yes. Right. Um, and mm-hmm. so there is 
there are these patterns, you know, these undeniable patterns of a lot of these major tech platforms giving preferential treatment to particularly, again, white men, kind of fostering white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... These are not the I think that's one of the biggest red flags in in looking at how these tech platforms are being given the power to regulate what kind of news items we see and to determine what is fake news and to try to implement those controls. Mm. Uh, doesn't bode well. <laughs> no, it does not. Yeah. It does not. I, I'm, I'm sitting here quietly outraged. I mean, what the, what are we supposed to do, Julianne? I mean, yeah. you know, I, 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 okay, so, so Tor is, is kind of on that, that, you know, not so refined or regulated or, yeah, I mean, but the, mm-hmm. the non regulation is what makes it appealing and actually makes it safe, right? It's that hold, I guess they're uh, most positive, their emblem or their, their symbol or whatever uh-huh. is an onion. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, just like you're peeling the pieces away, you know, from the onion, it's like, you know, it's just, yeah, yeah it's, it's and with those layers, and, you know, power in numbers, power in numbers. Right. So with that, you know, there can be some refining done or there can be, you know, protections that people can put on them themselves or on their computers more like, well, computers are pretty much a part of ourselves, right? <laughs> our, our persons, right? But, um, you know, so I, that there can be some protections that can be put into place for folks who want to use Tor. Yeah. Um, because that that's what it seems like. Well, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, from your article, it is verifying, you know, from all of your research, mm-hmm. you know, and you got some darn good quotes from people I and mean, heavyweights okay chris hedges that's, that's a heavyweight this mate character he's no lightweight you know what i'm saying i mean this is real yeah. talk you know no onions all puns intended anyways <laughs> <laughs> i mean what, what is it, it how long or how far off do you see uh these necessary protections that people would need to start using tour so that they can start getting the unfiltered news because um also, from a historical perspective, um, you know, these algorithms and, and all of this has been created by majority white men. So there's that mm-hmm. white male perspective coming from the left, coming from the right. It's still a white male perspective. Mm-hmm. So we've been tainted with that, with this information technology age, you know, of the Internet. Um, but with Tor, there's more variety. There's, you know, there, you can you can. You can be exposed to to the real unfilteredness of the information superhighway. So, mm-hmm. how far off are we as far as being able to get those necessary protections so that we're not hacked as soon as we log on? And and where are we in in terms of, of five years from now, ten years from now, from being able to just say, you know what, f you, um, <laughs> Google, Twitter, all that, and just branch out on our own? Um. That's a great question. It's it's hard to um, kind of extricate ourselves from monopolies um, by the very definition of a monopoly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I do hope that people's, you know, people. I think people are starting to understand, like their internet service providers. Um, you know, the like the um, mm-hmm. the telecommunications companies that yeah. they set up internet accounts with. Right. Um, have a pretty vast capacity to um, look at or, you know, report on and collect the data that they they provide when they use the Internet. Um, so, again, Tor is a great resource. Um, it, it does require some research in advance, but it is a great resource. It is a great kind of more secure alternative that's designed by people who specifically have cybersecurity in mind. Um, it's also used by a lot of activists. Um, mm-hmm. There are, you know, there are It's other- also used by a lot of hackers and thieves, too. That's why I was uh, <laughs> uh, plugging in the whole, you know, what can we do yes. to protect ourselves and then use Tor, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are also messaging apps like Signal. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There are messaging apps like Keybase that are, these are just more secure encrypted technologies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think another thing 
I think that is that is inspiring right now is again people who are who are thinking um, in very large terms. Um, there are several communities in the United States um, that have been historically underserved uh, technologically. I mean. In, Pretty much every sense, but including technologically, um, like American Indian communities. Um, there is a social justice uh, organization. We want to share a loving tribute to Eduardo, the great Uruguayan author of The Open Veins of Latin America, because his final book, Hunter of Stories, appears this November, a year and a half after Eduardo's death. KPFA has asked a few writers who love him to read his new stories to us and share their memories. Alice Walker, Al Young, Alejandro Murguia, and Aurora Levens Morales will do this on Sunday evening, November 19, 7.30 p.m. at First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing Way in Berkeley. This KPFA benefit has wheelchair access. Tickets are at brownpapertickets.com. Let your friends know, November 19th. Eduardo 